terrible at introductions, so I'm going to just hand over to uh, uh, Liwe Gampalala, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Pretoria. And uh, for her PhD, she's been investigating avian stress uh, and responses to stress, uh, to, act, uh, to activities associated with research, in particular, things like um, catching birds and, uh, and all of that. And she will talk to us about that. Uh, Lili Wei, you can tell us all about yourself. I'm terrible at introductions, as I said. So I will hand over to you now. And you need to unmute yourself and share your screen. Hi, everybody. So me and technology have a weird relationship. I'm gonna try and share this screen situation. Ah. There you oh. go. Okay. All right, so as Derek has already said, I'm Kaliwen Gampalala, a PhD candidate at the University of Pretoria. I am relatively new to the birding community. Um, school actually sort of forced me in this direction, but I have been enjoying myself. I recently got back from fieldwork in um, Namakwaland, where I saw lots of interesting birds that I had never seen before, um, but it was a bit dry, so it wasn't as fun as it was supposed to be. But yeah, um, so, Today, I will be, well, first and foremost, thank you for taking time off your schedules to listen to me talk about my project. Um, so today's presentation will focus mainly on some of the methods that we can use to quantify stress responses in birds. But before we get to that, I'd just like to tell you a bit about what I was doing for my PhD. Um, so my PhD aimed to answer two broad sorts of questions related to the welfare of birds, um, so related to avian stress responses. Um, okay, uh, another thing I would just like you to help me with, I tend to be fast when I'm nervous, so if I'm going too fast for you, just let me know, I will try to slow down. Slow down, please. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I will do my best. Okay, so my PhD aims to answer two broad suits of questions related to avian stress responses. The first part of my PhD looked at um, stress associated with the welfare of birds. So the stress that birds often um, have to endure when we do our ringing exercises or our ringing sessions. So I looked at stress responses to, kept, to capture in mist nets and um, short-term restraint, um, as well as responses to captivity. A lot of times as researchers, we need, to catch we need to catch birds and keep them in captivity for a little while so we can run our experiments. Previous studies have shown that stress, um, have shown that captivity is actually a stressor in birds. So what I was doing was look at um, how different stress responses would be if birds were kept in smaller indoor cages versus outdoor aviaries. So I will talk about this um, close to the end of this presentation. The second part of my PhD looked at the potential of using captive birds to quantify stress responses to high air temperatures. This is particularly important now as temperatures continue to increase as a result of climate change. And birds find themselves facing a lot of physiological challenges um, due to this. Now, some of you may have heard about the numerous birds that died in um, Guazulu Natal towards the end of last year. These birds and a lot more died because there was just one day in the week where air temperatures were above um, 43, deg 43 degrees. They actually went up to 45 degrees Celsius. And um, that same afternoon and the following morning, rangers were faced with a large number of birds that were dead on scene. So um, these are some of the pictures that, that they took. If you are interested in that story, um, it was recently published as an article in Austral Ecology by my supervisor, Andrew McKechnie, and some of his collaborators. So before we move on to you know, um, stress response uh, analysis and, and, and measurements and whatnot, we need to sort of come um, into an understanding of what we mean when we talk about stress. 
So stress is one of those words that are not very easy to define. Um, I did a quick uh, search on Google and I came out with over 1 billion hits in less than, or in about one second. Well, it was actually less than a second. And um, while I did not go through this, I am pretty sure um, they actually were not, like they did not have the same definition of what stress is. So in their book titled Stress in Wild Animals and How They Cope, Romero and Moonfield suggest that the reason why we have a difficult time defining stress is because we all experience stress differently. So then when we try to explain what stress means, we sort of bring our own interpretations and our own understandings of the situation that it becomes a bit confusing. So scientists, biologists in particular, have been studying um, have been studying stress for a number of decades. So starting uh, in the late 1940s, I believe the first paper was published in 1946. And in that time, there hasn't been one uniting definition of stress. So now there's sort of a general understanding that the word stress can refer to three different but related um, topics. So the first is stressors. So you can, when you talk about stress, you could be referring to stressful stimuli. These are environmental changes or intrinsic changes of stimuli that cause stress, stressful stimuli. You can also use the word stress to refer to your stress responses. When one says, I am stressed, they're not actually talking about what is causing the stress, but they're talking about what they are going through in trying to deal with the stress. So the physiological and psychological responses to stressful stimuli. That is what we refer to um, as stress as well. We can also use the word stress to refer to chronic stress, chronic stress effects. So these are the disease, diseases and conditions that come about as a result of as a result of an overstimulation of the stress response. For this presentation, I will focus mainly on the stress response. Okay, so what exactly is the stress we talk about? So the vertebrate stress response, um, seeing as birds are vertebrates, has been conserved over, million, over millions of years and across taxa. What this, what this means is that the basic mechanisms and the reactions as well as the compounds involved in the stress response is um, similar across groups of animals. So we know because it's the vertebrate stress response, it is similar across vertebrates. But there's also been studies um, in invertebrates where they've indicated that they um, found proteins and peptides that are similar to the compounds that we found in the that we find in the vertebrate stress response. So this indicates that the stress and responses to stress are important for the survival of organisms. Some, had, some authors have gone on to say that the stress response is actually important for evolution. It is important for, our, for how individuals adapt to new environments and how they then get to habitate, um, new, inhabitate new places. Um, while others have said, you know, the stress response is actually important for both individual and population fitness. So this um, stress response is often referred to as the neuroendocrine stress response because it involves both the neural and the endocrine, um, the endocrine systems. So in the neural system, it involves primarily the central nervous system, which um, plays a big role in the fight or flight response. And then the endocrine system, of course, is the system that is involved with the production and secretion of hormones. Now, because this is such a complex system, it, it, it involves a wide range of reactions and hormones, um, but there are two classes of hormones, the catecholamines and the glucocorticoids, that are considered to be the center or to be in the center of this whole um, vertebrate stress response. So, okay, I will just talk about that, these in the next couple of slides. But the important thing to note is that we are not all going to respond to a stimulus the same way. So the ability of an individual to mount a stress response will um, lie on its ability to one, detect the stimulus and then interpret it as a stressor. So I will make an example. If you have a 
bulbul, for example. So this is a typically wild bird, but one that you've been hand rearing in your home and it is used to the presence of dogs. And then you have a bird from the same species that has grown up in the wild. And then you expose them to the same stressor, which would be the presence of a dog. Um, those birds are not going to respond to the presence of the dog the same way because they have different experiences. So this is what we mean by an individual needs to sort of detect and then, um, you know, identify the stimulus as a stressor. Okay. So once a stimulus has been identified as a stressor, the hypothalamus in the brain will send signals to the central nervous system. Um, together with the adrenal medulla, these, there will be, okay, so there will be certain reactions, which I won't go into, that will result in the secretion of catecholamines. So these are adrenaline or no adrenaline, also, called, also referred to as epinephrine and no epinephrine. These hormones will then sort of, um, prepare the animal to deal with whatever stressor it is dealing with at the moment. Whether the animal decides to fight or flee will be, um, you know, the, 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 the catecholamines prepare it for whatever reaction it chooses. Now, this is achieved by increasing heart rates, um, among other processes. So the increase of heart rate ensures that more blood is pumped into the extremities. In the um, case of birds, that would be the, the wings and the legs. So they're able to get out of the situation or to even fight the situation. There's also improved uh, efficiency of gaseous exchange to make sure that this blood that goes to these extremities actually has enough oxygen and enough glucose to actually help the animal. Now, this process occurs within seconds of stressor initiation. So it is quick and it is fast and it happens so quickly that it is difficult for us uh, mere mortals to actually quantify the changes in, in, in catecholamine concentrations. However, some researchers have um, looked at, you know, quantifying differences in heart rate to see whether a stimulus or a certain event is a stressor. Um, the increase in catecholamines also kickstarts or sort of stimulates the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is the axis that is responsible for the secretion of um, glucorticoids. Um, part of this process involves the secretion of um, ACTH, which I will talk about um, later. Um, ACTH is the adrenocotropic hormone, um, which then travels to the adrenal glands and stimulate um, increased secretion secretion of glucocorticoids into the system. So what exactly are these glucocorticoids I keep talking about? So glucocorticoids, GC for short, because glucocorticoid is a mouthful, um, are steroid hormones that are made from the interactions of um, cholesterol. Sorry. Now we have two, type, two types of uh, glucocorticoids, corticosterone, which is the main GC in most mammals and fish. And then we have, we have cortisol, which is the main um, GC in most mammals and fish. And then we have corticosterone, which is the primary GC in birds, in amphibians, in reptiles, and some rodents. And then you have special species where you will find that this animal produces both cortisol and corticosterone. Um, the few that have been sort of properly studied have been found to like, so if an individual produces both GCs, cortisol tends to be the prevalent one. Now, based on concentrations of GCs, um, so corticosterone in birds, are important for physiology, development, and behavior, playing important roles in uh, salt and energy man management, so much so that without these baseline concentrations, birds might actually die. Now, these concentrations will change predictably with the time of day. So um, in, in most cases, they tend to be higher during the bird's inactive period. So if it's a nocturnal bird, if it's a nocturnal bird, then just the concentrations tend to be higher during the day. They also tend to change predictably with season um, as well as life history stages. So birds that are in their reproductive season or their breeding season will either have lower or, or lower or higher GC concentrations depending on the environment in which they are breeding. Um, a number of studies have also looked at birds that are molting. 
and they found that girls that are undergoing molds um, tend to have lower GC concentrations, probably because there is a negative relationship between GC concentrations and growth. Now, GC concentrations can be elevated due to non-stressful events such as um, such as um, courtship and copulation, as well as hunting. But in most cases where you find an individual, an individual with elevated glucocorticoid concentrations, it is in response to a stressor. So how does this help the animal? So elevations in glucocorticoids allow or help animals to survive the stressor by enabling them to restore homeostasis. So um, this is achieved by um, the reallocation of um, resources away from energetically costly um, activities. So I said earlier, there is a negative relationship between um, growth and um, GC concentrations. This is because when GC concentrations increase, um, things that are not you know, important at this point. So things like growth, uh, reproduction and immune function are sort of relegated in, um, in the, so are sort of relegated so that um, activities that promote survival, so increased uh, cognitive abilities, uh, increased locomotor activities are sort of put in the forefront to ensure that the individual survives the stressor. Now, in the case of a, healthy organism or a healthy bird, you will see an increase in GC concentrations in response to a stressor that will um, be followed by a decline once the stressor has been um, dealt with or once the stressor ceases. And this is because of a process referred to as negative feedback. So through the interactions of the hypothalamus and the adrenal glands, um, GC concentrations return back to baseline. However, in the case of an animal that is facing perpetual stressors or an animal whose um, stress response mechanisms are faulty, you will find that the negative feedback is then affected and therefore um, GC concentrations remain elevated. And since we said that the elevation of um, GC concentrations affects reproduction and growth and immune function, then these animals find themselves facing um, challenges such as dwarfism and um, immune dysfunction and all of those things. Now, how high or how long the elevations in GCs last or how high they go will then reflect the magnitude of the stress response. So if then there is a higher um, or a greater magnitude of the stress response, it probably indicates that the animal um, finds that situation or that event more stressful than an event where there will be a lower sort of um, reaction. Now, if we know the baseline concentrations, we are then able to measure the magnitude of the stress response by quantifying the alterations um, from baseline to whatever concentration the GC con to whatever concentrations GC elevations get up to. So in this um, slide, we see an example of um, data uh, plotted from um, female Eastern bluebirds um, where the birds were caught and then a blood sample was collected within three minutes to ensure that a baseline concentration was recorded. The birds were then put in, in um, bird bags and then um, samples were collected at intervals. Um, so at 15, 30 and 60 minutes and then the birds were released. Now, the magnitude of the stress response may also depend on the bird's previous experiences. So as you can see here, we have two plots. The lower plot presents birds that were experiencing the stressor for the second or third time. So they were used to whatever situation that they were going through. And then this top one, I have lost my cursor. This top one um, um, is, 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 is plotted for birds that were experiencing the stressor for the first time. So this was a novel experience for them and therefore they mounted a greater stress response. Now, so you will see here that, um, that GC concentration, so corticosterone, as I said, corticosterone is the main GC in birds. Corticosterone increased rapidly from less than three minutes to um, 15 minutes. 
and then there was a steady increase until 30 minutes, which seems to be the peak, um, which seems to be the time where the birds reach their peak concentrations, and then concentrations returned back to base. Well, not necessarily returned, but as you can see, by the time you get to 60, they are declining and, and sort of um, going back to baseline, which we don't see here because samples, the last samples were collected at 60 minutes. Um, so this would indicate that these are healthy birds that are able to deal with their stressors and whatnot. Now, as I said, um, a lot of in a lot of studies they collect blood samples. This is a common method for quantifying stress because, um, particularly for acute or short-term stress responses. So, if you want to see how a bird responds to a specific event, the use of blood is great for that because blood gives a, a snapshot of the bird's condition at the time of the sample collection. So, blood is great for acute stress responses. So then a lot of studies will use the capture restraint method. You catch, so the bird hits the net or whatever um, method, catching method you are using, you run. So first you start a stopwatch so that you can know how long, um, like sort of you can measure the time between um, the bird hitting the net and um, sample collection. And then you run, you get the bird out, you collect a blood sample and um, the blood sample is then allowed to sit and clot for a couple of hours. And then it is um, centrifuged to separate red blood cells from the serum. The serum is then frozen and then um, at minus, well, we freeze it at minus 20 degrees. And then we um, sort of analyze it to um, determine GC concentrations. Um, in most cases, we will collect blood samples um, through the brachial vein. Um, and then we use um, cotton wool to sort of stop the bleeding. So I also used the capture restraint method, but unlike the standard method where people um, will collect between four to six um, samples from the same individuals, I collected a single blood sample from each bird. And because of that, I ended up needing a lot of birds. So I needed like 60 individuals per species. Uh, as a result, I had to work on the most common birds found in Pretoria. So I worked on um, duck-capped bubbles, garu thrushes, laughing doves, um, speckled mouse birds, and southern mast weavers. I collected a, max, a sample maximum 0.2 mils um, from each individual. Um, the samples were centrifuged, and then the um, serum was analyzed using an enzyme immunoassay. I will talk about enzyme immunoassays just now. Um, so what we found, um, from these five species was that there was indeed a difference in um, GC concentrations both, both at baseline and stress-induced among the five species. So here we we're looking at um, stress responses to um, capture and short-term restraint. Um, and we found that Karu thrushes had the highest GC concentrations both at baseline and um, stress-induced concentrations. But that does not necessarily mean that they're the most stressed birds. So um, then we looked at the other species and we found that speckled mouse birds, for example, while they had the lowest baseline GC concentrations, they had the highest stress response magnitude. That is the difference from um, baseline and peak um, GC concentrations was eightfold in these birds, while the garut thrushes had a threefold increase. Um, speckled, sorry. Um, the weavers and the laughing doves also had a threefold increase, and then the bulbuls had a fivefold increase. So, of the passerine species, um, bulbuls, garu thrushes, and musk, uh, weavers, um, bulbuls had the lowest baseline GCs and the highest magnitude, um, stress response magnitude, with a fivefold increase. An interesting thing that we notice. Um, but we can't really say for sure that this is the case because we haven't actually conducted experiments to see if it is a, a trend across birds or it was something weird that was happening with our birds, was that um, the birds that were generally agitated, so garu thrushes and mast weavers, if you have ever caught must if you've caught ever caught any weaver, you know how crazy they get. So there was biting, there was yelling, and all of those things actually had lower stress response magnitudes than the birds that um, were calm. So if, if, if you are out on your ringing excursion and whatnot, this is sort of something to, to keep in mind that just because a bird is, cal is sitting calmly in the net does not necessarily mean it is less stressed than the birds that are in your face and demanding to be removed from the nest net. Okay, 
So this um, slide sort of just shows you what I found um, and the fact that um, the trend is not the same across species. So as you can see here for the mouse birds and the mouse weavers, um, just the concentrations were actually highest at 60 minutes, which indicates that had we collected samples for longer, we would have seen whether they were still going to continue going up or they were going to start declining. But our experimental design had us collecting samples until 60 minutes. And the um, bulbuls and thrushes um, show uh, peak concentrations at 30 minutes. Now, I'm sure you can see that um, sort of the, the, the graphs are plotted differently. So for these two species, we could not get enough um, individuals in winter. So we only have samples from summer. And then for the three species this side, we got enough birds in both summer and winter. So we were able to collect you know, samples from both summer and winter to see if there's any seasonal difference in just the concentrations in these birds. We found no significant differences, both at baseline and GC concentration, which was surprising, but um, it is what it is. Um, but we see that um, garu thrushes actually pick earlier in winter. This is something that has been um, observed in um, one or two species in North America. We are not really sure what it means, but it's still an, an interesting observation to see that the birds will mount a stress response, a slightly different straight res st stress response response um, depending on the time of year. Okay, so I've spoken about how blood is the commonly used metrics and whatnot, but I'm sure most of you will agree with me in that this method is actually quite invasive because you have, you know, don't only have to catch the bird, but then you must handle it and then prick it with a needle just to get a tiny blood sample. And because of this, it is difficult to use this method for small birds because you can't collect as many samples as you would from, um, I don't know, a bigger bird, I suppose. So then the alternative matrices or alternative methods that we can use to quantify stress responses. However, while in blood, we are able to quantify the hormone itself, which makes life um, quite easy, in these other matrices, we have to quantify um, the metabolites of the hormones. So the metabolites of um, the, 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 the glucocorticoids, or in the case of birds, the corticosterone. Now, I, one thing I forgot to mention is that a lot of people would refer to glucocorticoids as stress hormones, um, but that would indicate that they cause stress. In actual fact, these hormones help you deal with your stressor. So some authors have actually said, let's rather not refer to them as stress hormones. If we must do that, then maybe anti-stress hormones. There's always interesting um, discussions among um, endocrinologists and such. So anyways, um, the circulating juicy, um, the circulating juices, your, cortico your corticosterone in birds. So you will find it um, flowing in blood and then goes through the liver and whatnot. So circulating glucocorticoids are metabolized in the liver. And then the metabolites are excreted via the bile and then out through um, droppings in so like feces um, and then, uh, through the kidney and come out through urine. urine. So then um, in birds, because we get a combination of the two, we just get our FGCMs in um, fecal glucocorticoid metabolites in our dropping samples. Um, the metabolites are also deposited in the growing structures of keratinized um, materials. So your hair, feathers in birds, whiskers, and even possibly, um, scales and pangolins. There's someone um, in the lab who was actually looking at reproductive hormones and if we can actually see them um, and, and measure them in pangolin scales, which is actually a cool project. Now, um, so for example, with the feathers, if um, your bird or whatever bird you are looking at um, goes through a, a stressful event and you know when this event happened and you know when the feather started growing and you know the feathers growth rate, then you are able to sort of determine the stress response to that specific event um, of that bird using the feather. I personally did not do this for my project. I focused on poop because poop is easy and exciting. <laughs> So 
then uh, the metabolites that are produced in poop or in droppings, because different individuals, um, sometimes in some species, you actually find that there's differences between males and females, um, older and younger birds and whatnot. But basically the, 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 the metabolism of the metabolites will differ uh, between species such that the metabolites that are produced um, have different polarities, have different compositions and different um, quantities of specific metabolites. Um, therefore, there is a need to validate um, whatever, whatever method you are going to use. So whether we are measuring the hormones themselves or we are measuring their metabolites, um, the, 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 the measurement of um, steroid hormones usually requires the use of what we refer to as immunoassays. So these will either come as radioactive immunoassays or as enzyme-based immunoassays. The lab where my um, samples are analyzed strictly uses enzyme immunoassays because um, you know, to avoid the whole radioactive business and trying to get rid of, 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 of the surplus or the, um, you know, whatever materials are left behind. Now, um, for an anti, sorry, for an immunoassay to work um, appropriately or to be the appropriate um, one for analyzing um, your, your, your steroid hormones, it needs to be able to interact um, with the hormone itself or its metabolites. So then we can determine um, how much or yes, the quantity of the metabolites in that um, solution or in that poop sample or in that dropping sample. So usually, the interactions between the reagents that the reagents of the immunoassay and the metabolites will result in a color change. And depending on the degree of the color change, um, the technicians in the lab are then able to determine um, the um, concentration of whatever metabolites we are looking at. And okay, so that's that. Um, so as already mentioned, um, the use of fecal glucocorticoid metabolized analysis um, is quite interesting and quite cool. And as such, it has gained uh, popularity over the past two or three decades. And this is because it is less invasive than blood sampling, probably even less invasive than the plucking of feathers. Because with this method, as long as you can see the animal, you are able to collect um, as many samples as you want, as many times as you want, without actually disturbing the animal. There is also the fact that while in blood we get a report of the instant at which the blood sample is collected. With fecal samples, we get an average of GC concentrations over hours or days. And some scientists um, consider this a more accurate measurement of GC concentrations. However, as I already said, it requires um, a validation. So this validation can um, either be an analyt analytical validation where you want to see whether the enzyme immuno or radio immuno assay that you are using is accurate and precise to the metabolites you are working with. There is also a biological validation and a, a physiological validations which we use to determine whether the changes in FGCM concentrations reflect the changes in circulating GCs. So you don't want a situation where you see an increase in uh, GC concentrations in the blood, but it is not reflected in the um, in your dropping in your dropping samples, because then that means you cannot use droppings as a metrics for that species. So then biological um, validations can involve any sort of event that any sort of stressful event that the animal can sort of go through and then you collect samples and then you analyze them and then you see if there's an actual um, sort of um, difference in like prior to the event and post the event. Most people have used translocation events for this. Um, and then there's also a physiological validation where we sort of trick the um, bird's physiological setup to in, to, 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 to respond to a, a pharmacological stressor. So the most common used method here is what we refer to as an ACTH challenge. So I said earlier that um, ACTH produced in the anterior um, pituitary gland will um, stimulate the secretion of glucocorticoids into the bloodstream. 
So then we inject or feed the birds with an ACTH con containing substance. Um, in my lab, we use what we refer to as Stenacthet. So I will just, I will just use this um, recent study. Um, so we recently published this um, paper in Journal of Ornithology, looking at um, validating uh, the FGCM concentration analysis for um, Southern yellow-billed hornbills. So what we did here was we caught the birds, we kept them for a while so they could get used to um, confinement and captivity. And then we put them in, in, in different um, sort of cages. So we could see which bird uh, pooped where and when, but because, um, Breeding, um, because breeding pairs of hornbills do not take kindly to being separated, they were able to see and hear each other, so that sort of sort of to deal with the stress that may have caused. So we collected blood samples, sorry, we collected fecal samples for two um, hours prior to um, injecting the birds with um, two international units of the ACTH containing, two international units per kilogram of the ACTH containing um, substance. And then just before we collected, so just before we injected the birds with synaxin, we collected a small blood sample to determine baseline concentrations. And then 30 minutes post that, we collected a blood sample to see if there were changes um, after the, the ACTH injection. And then we continued to collect fecal samples for six hours um, post injection, so we could see how long because the, the 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 bird's diet and size, which will then affect gut passage time, will also determine how long it takes before you can actually see the changes in FGCM concentrations in the droppings. So as you can see here, there is a clear difference in GC concent in circulating GC concentrations pre and post injection. And then as you can as you see here, um, GC concentrations were, um, so in our post injection, you can start seeing a slight increase in, G in FGCM concentrations. And then they continue to increase until peak concentrations are reached three hours post injection. Now, to make sure that we find an assay that works for that specific species, we have to use um, different, several different assays um, so that we can identify the one that works best. So for these birds, we used five different assays. As you can see here, the, ass the assays actually have very interesting um, names. So that is tetrahydrocorticosterone, um, which is THCC for short, um, and then 11 oxo. So we used five immuno enzyme immunoassays, and then we found these two to be the best performing for this species. As you can see, there's actually a difference in the amount of FGCMs that these um, two assays can actually detect. So what this indicates is that THCC, which, in, which was able to detect a higher rate of FGCMs, is um, the best one to use for these birds because it is able to detect even the smallest changes in the, F, in the specific FGC, in the specific FGCMs that are found in the droppings of this specific bird. Once we have validated an um, enzyme immune assay for that specific species, we are then able to use that assay to quantify stress responses to whatever variable we choose. So once we have found the assay, we can use it to answer a broad range of questions related to that species. The one thing to remember is that these things are species specific, so you need to validate for each and every species you want to look at, which makes it um, a bit too much. So we have successfully done validations for laughing doves, southern pied bubblers, the hornbills, and white brown sparrow rivers. We tried and are still trying to do a validation for folktail strongers. These beautiful, beautiful birds are a bit frustrating. So we have tested um, four of the five um, assays that we have in the lab. And while THCC seemed to be the best performing for a subset of the species, it doesn't, there isn't a clear result for the whole data set. So this either means that we need to need, we need to use a higher concentration of the um, ACTH containing substance, so synaphen, to see if it can actually elicit a greater stress response that then the assays can pick up, 
need to try even more assays, um, indicating that the assays that we have in the lab actually just don't work for these birds. So it is going to, um, to be interesting to try and see um, what comes up next with these birds because they've, they've been frustrating me quite a lot. So I'm, interesting, I'm interested to see, um, to sort of figure out what is happening with them. Okay, so once we have, so once we have, um, as I already said, once we have validated an assay for a species, we are then able to use it um, to quantify responses to whatever variable we choose. So um, just for this, I'm just going to make an example of um, the captivity stress study that I did, um, looking at whether birds um, respond differently when kept indoors than outdoors. So we took 10 laughing doves that we caught at the University of Pretoria. We put them in um, cages in temperature controlled rooms and um, light was pro provided using fluorescent bulbs. And then the other 10 birds were kept um, in aviaries outdoors where they had access to natural light and they had a bit more flight space. What we found, which is what we expected, was that birds in outdoor aviaries are actually less stressed than birds in indoor cages. So what this suggests is that while um, we may need to keep birds in captivity for research purposes, it is always better or it is best to keep them in outdoor aviaries where, can they, where they can fly um, a bit more, where they have access to natural light and um, where you know they can actually um, see what is happening with the with, with with the natural cycles in weather and all of those things. So if it is at all possible when you are conducting your research to keep your birds in outdoor aviaries, that is what um, is actually recommended because the birds seem to like that better than being um, in small cages indoors um, and being exposed to fluorescent light um, more than half the day. So yes, um, the take home message here is um, we can quantify um, stress responses in um, birds um, with um, using blood being the easiest um, sort of method that doesn't even require validation. But this method is invasive. So it is a method that should be avoided if it is at all possible. The other possibility then is using fecal GC metabolite analysis, which is a non-invasive method, allows continuous sampling, but requires valid a validation for each and every species. You can't just say, oh, this is a turtle dove and this is a, a laughing dove, so they are related, so I'm going to use the same thing, because chances are the metabolites that are being secreted or being excreted by um, those species are different. So what this tells us, because as far as we know, um, I, I, can't, I can't be too sure about this, but as far as we know, this was the first study looking at um, GC concentrations in South African birds. There have been studies looking at mammals, particularly elephants and leopards and um, all of those fancy animals, but um, there, has, there hasn't been anything looking at South African birds. So we think um, this is a small step towards the right direction, especially if we are going to, you know, um, be, be, be assisting and sort of in communication with, with our, um, you know, local communities and local birders so that we can all work together to sort of make sure that the birds that we use for um, our research, whether we, 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 we are rigging them so that we can see how the populations are doing or whether we are doing um, experiments in the lab um, to make sure that the birds are, are happy and, and, and they are well taken care of. Um, so yeah, we think um, this is one step, one small step towards the right direction, but we still have a long way to go. Um, I would just like to thank all of you for listening to me um, ramble on about my project. I'd like to thank my supervisors, Andrew McKechnie, Susan Nicholson, and Ander Hanswit, um, the Endocrine Research Lab, and the Poop Group, which is a lovely group of young scientists who are looking at non-invasive methods for quantifying um, stress and reproductive hormones. I would also like to thank the Hot Birds Research Group and the Field and Lab Assistants that have made this possible, as well as the lovely organizations that ensured that I had money to do what I was doing. Um, so yeah, over you to over to you, Derek, and thank you, thank you so much for um, having me. Thank you so much, Lili Wei. Uh, that was a really interesting presentation. I'm going to allow
people to unmute themselves since it's um, the there's a relatively lower number of people here as soon as I figure out how to do that. Um, <clears throat> so you should be able to unmute yourself and you can just go ahead and ask uh, in any way, uh, whatever questions you have. Uh, or you can type them in the chat and I will read them out. <laughs> It seems like, amazingly, we have no questions. <laughs> Either means I explained this very well or it was confusing. Um, um, go ahead. Yes. So the labs are at the University of Pretoria, the endocrine research labs um, run by Andre Hanswind and um, his team of technologists. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, I would think I would think if 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 we as bed ringers are better informed in 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 you know which species need to be removed first from mist nets because they are struggling with the situation, it should help improve the welfare of the birds we are ringing. Um, as to whether it changes anything, I am not too sure, but we will see once we have published the results and also try, um, the, the, the plan is to try and sort of write a popular article in the BirdLife magazine so that the actual bird ringers can have access to this information. Hopefully it will, you know, have some sort of impact and a recommendation. Um, yeah. Um, so bird ringers and, 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 and loggers and all of this, um, and mo most studies have found that rings are less stressful than all of the other methods um, because they're quite light. And unless the bird gets caught and stuck on something, it's usually just a happy bird flying around and whatnot. Tags, I would think it depends on the size and all of those things, but rings um, are sort of like the, the best way to do it because um, of course the, the, the initial process of ringing the bird is stressful, but the stress lasts about an hour and then the bird is fine again. Uh. <laughs> ah, yes, the predation story. So there have been a couple of studies that actually looked at, you know, capture stress and predation stress. The truth of the matter is predation is actually more stressful than capture stress. So bird ringing is, is less stressful than a bird that has to deal with the predator in the wild. So yeah, it is, it is, it is not, it doesn't cause like too much damage or whatnot, but it is, it is best to know which species require, you know, certain um, treatment so that we keep all of our birds ha happy. So the point of my first chapter and the whole bird ringing thing was to try and see if there are differences among common species that find themselves in the mist nets. So if you find um, mouse birds and weavers in the net, who do you get out first? It was sort of that thing, um, if that makes sense, Bruce. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I don't think there is. Um, I don't think there is, way, there is a way to, to, to like visually tell that a bird is stressed. Um, well, not, not if you are photographing them, but like if, if, if you have them in captivity for a while, then they will start, start plucking their own feathers and doing all sorts of things. But if it's just sitting there and you are taking pictures, chances of you actually being able to tell are quite slim as, as far as I can tell. Just to add to that as a photographer, <clears throat> I think the birds will fly away or run away long before they get uh, ter to- Yes. <laughs> They will indicate their unhappiness by leaving you. Yes. 
Any other questions before we close up for the evening? Before the afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you for listening, Natalie. Thanks everybody for coming and uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon on Learn the Birds. We do have a, another webinar tomorrow um, and Judith who is actually presenting uh, the webinar is here this evening, Judith uh, Mirembe, um, will be presenting the, the webinar tomorrow on birding uh, forest endemics in Uganda. So come back if you're interested uh, and we'll see you all again. Thanks very much, Tliliwe. Thank you, Derek, for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody.